Okay. It is seven o'clock and so in order to be respectful of everybody's time, we are going to get started. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm Kate, I'm the Director of Environment Maryland. Um, Conservation Conversations has been going on for about four months now, which is crazy to think about. Bridget and I started this series at the beginning of um, social distancing because we wanted to one, create an opportunity for people to still come together in a sense um, in isolation. And then the other thing we really wanted was to offer an opportunity where, you know, we all have this, this kind of time and this amazing opportunity to connect with people that we may have otherwise never been able to learn from before. So we wanted to create an opportunity to learn about nature for nature's sake and to learn about conservation topics that maybe you've never had time to engage with before. Um, and the other incredible part of this whole thing is we're able to learn from people across the country. So we have people on here from everywhere um, and we're able to learn from experts in the field from across our, across our country. So thank you for coming. Thank you for being on. I am going to turn it over to Bridget for some logistical things and then we are going to get to our uh, conversation. Thanks, Kate. So I am Bridget Sanderson. I'm the Director of Environment Missouri based out of Kansas City, Missouri. Um, thank you again so much for coming on for Conservation Conversations. This is a special one. Uh, we did a, a climate um, film festival, so we're really looking forward to this Conservation Conversations. Um, just a couple of things. We do want to start off by saying Congratulations to the House of Representatives for passing the Great American Outdoors Act, which we've been working very hard on. We did an, um, the Great American Outdoors Act rally a couple weeks ago, so we're really excited that that passed, and we're looking forward to hopefully seeing the president sign it and everything and getting it enacted to protect our public lands. Also, um, at the end, we're going to save questions uh, at the very end for James. So if you have questions and you're on the Zoom webinar, we have a chat or a Q&A portion. We can keep up to date with both of those. Or if you're on the Facebook live stream, just put them in the comment section and we'll ask as many as we can um, at the end of this. So I'm gonna go ahead and let Jess take over. So thank you so much, y'all. Yeah, thanks Bridget. So thank you again for everyone for joining us tonight. Um, I'm Jess, a coalition coordinator with Environment Colorado's Climate Defenders Campaign. And I'm very excited for this event tonight because we're combining our conservation conversation with this week's installment of our Climate Film Festival. And for this discussion, we're joined by James Baylog. Uh, James is an acclaimed environmental photographer working to change the way the world sees climate change, quite literally. In 2005, he set off to the Arctic to document evidence of human impact on nature. There, he discovered a landscape in flux and a desire to record that change over time. James founded the Extreme Ice Survey, which works to give a visual voice to our planet's changing ecosystems through the use of continuous time-lapse time photography. Chasing Ice tells the story of this Extreme Ice Survey's beginnings and showcases years of change in a matter of minutes. In the film, James and his team discuss the factors causing these changes and their me methodologies for capturing them. And while the Extreme Ice Survey is the most wide-ranging, ground-based photographic study of glaciers ever conducted, that's not all he's done. He's also the founder and president of Earth Vision Institute, an organization that is dedicated to creating and publishing and sharing world-class visual stories and rich media content. James and his work have received many awards, and he's presented at a number of prestigious places. So we are very honored to have him with us tonight. Hi, James, and thank you so much for being here. Good evening. Thanks for having me. That, you know, that was quite a nice intro. If I could just have that uh, manuscript, you could save me a paragraph that I have to write for a book tomorrow. So, uh, okay, come on. Yes. Let's have it. Nice. Great. Uh, so for this evening's format, we are going to do um, sort of moderated Q&A, and then we'll open it up to audience questions. Uh, so to jump right in, James, what initially inspired you to photograph ice? Well, I've been fascinated by it for a very, very long time. It really comes from uh, in my early 20s, uh, being on glaciers for the first time in, in Austria and in Switzerland and France. Um, I was always interested in them based on the pictures I had seen. But once you get out on those places, you just feel this tremendous uh, uh, 
there's a beauty, there's a serenity, there's a sense of presence, there's something under your feet uh, that even though it's inanimate, it's um, different than walking on rocks or rocking, walking on soil. You feel that there's something there that's very specific. It's a strange business, uh, but I've always been interested in it. And uh, uh, just, you know, since those early glaciers, I've been a lot of places in South America and Asia and Africa and in Europe and Alaska and Greenland and Iceland and Antarctica on ice. And uh, it never ceases to fascinate me. Uh, and I guess it's sort of a falling in love kind of a thing. Uh, and, and like a first true love, it never lets go. Beautiful, thank you. And so in the film, viewers become very familiar with certain glaciers. And I was wondering if you can give us an update on maybe how those glaciers have changed since the film was released and any status or updates on the Extreme Ice Survey itself. Yeah, that's a huge question and we're actually yes considering doing a something of a sequel to the to the to the film because so much has changed you know the film came out in 2012 but the last of those time lapse pictures are just part way through 2011 that's 9 years ago and basically all the ice you see in that film is gone there's none of that is left except uh in a couple of rare rare circumstances but uh uh, you know, that Solheim, uh, Sol Solomayikit, that, that one in Iceland where we started the, the camera sequence, uh, there hasn't been ice in, in that field of view for many years at this point. And we've had to turn the cameras up valley to keep watching the change in the ice. And it's just a long, long way up. Same with Columbia Glacier. In fact, at Columbia Glacier in Alaska, where, um, where that whole Alaskan scene takes place, that camera position is completely useless because the glacier is miles up the valley now and all you're doing is looking edge on at a little piece of glacier that's way off on the horizon in the distance. And uh, we're actually uh, having a phone call tomorrow trying to figure out uh, how we're going to uh, uh, decommission those original cameras and move everything way, way up the valley to keep up with the ice. There is a camera way up there right now, but uh, we don't have enough to keep watching. So in any case, the point is that the, the ice has continued to change just as the climate has continued to change and uh, things are really radically different than they were originally. And I, I would emphasize that when I started this project in 2007, um, I swear I didn't know what would happen. You know, literally, I, I mean, it all seems obvious now. You see a movie, you hear me talking about it. We do a, we do another movie that involves these pictures. I do books and so on. It just seems like it was a foregone conclusion, a fait accompli. But when it started, I had no idea. Literally, I thought out of the 25 cameras I put out in the field, I figured, oh, you know, maybe we'll see a bit of action on maybe three, three of those cameras. Uh, and I also didn't know if... Uh, 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 where the where the cameras would go exactly, how we would get there, would we have positions to put the cameras into, would the world care? That was a huge, huge question. And there was a question of how I would keep paying for this network of cameras and travel experiences to take care of the cameras. And uh, all of those questions got resolved. And the real, real shock in relationship to your original question is simply that all the cameras saw a huge change on the glaciers, and we've had this tremendous record that's been compiled of how these landscapes have changed. Uh, we've kind of lost track of how many images are in the, uh, in the digital file right now, but it's somewhere on the order of 1.5 million frames watching all of these different sites changing. And since the film was made, we also put uh, 15 cameras down in the Southern Hemisphere on the Antarctic Peninsula you know, on this uh, island called South Georgia out in the South Atlantic. And uh, so we've got cameras down there watching the world as well. So it's, uh, it's a big project, a lot has happened and nothing has been the same as it was when we started. I'm sorry, that was a long-winded answer, but there's a, a lot to tell you. <laughs> yeah, so the Extreme Ice Survey is still active. Yeah, yeah, we, we have fewer cameras out now than we did uh, in past years. You know, it has just become too, uh, too crushing to keep, uh, 
visiting these places and, and spending the vast amounts of money that are required to keep all this alive. But we still have cameras in uh, Alaska, um, Iceland, uh, Antarctica, and there are sites in Canada, uh, France, and uh, let's see, Canada, France, and Switzerland that I go back to, uh, you know, every few years and I put my camera in the same uh, tripod holes I was in years ago and at least just do another shot of a, of a given situation. Mm -hmm. uh, if I had known that this project would, would be going on for this many years, I probably would not have put out so many uh, time-lapse cameras. I would have just planned to go back every few years and, and look at things. But, you know, that was another big surprise. When this started in 2007, I thought, okay, two winters, three summers, it'll be done. And then we got to three summers and everything was changing like crazy. And we said, oh, okay, let's go to, you know, five years. That, that ought to be about right. We got to five years and the answer was, no, 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 no. Well, let's go to 10 years. And now we're, I think this is field season number 14 right now, if I count it right. So it keeps on, keeps on going, which is a wonderful thing. And yet at the same time, it's sort of a... You know, you're kind of bonded and shackled to it. And, and there are days when I think, oh, man, uh, <laughs> this is a lot to keep pulling this wagon and pull this weight and keep it going. But, uh, you know, it's, my, it's my, uh, my duty and my honor and my opportunity in life to, to do it regardless. We certainly appreciate you doing it. Um, and so as we've been talking about, you've devoted your career to exploring the relationship between humans and nature and the effects that we have. And you achieve this through an expert combination of art and science and reveal that connection through visually engaging and impactful photography. And so how has this approach changed the conversation on climate change? Yeah, well, the, the, the big point on climate change certainly has come from the ice. There's no question about that. Um, you know, back when we started and we started to bring these pictures into public awareness, almost right away in 2007, as soon as we had the first downloads and we saw what was happening, we brought the pictures into the world. So in 07, 08, 09, these were very much a part of the national conversation, international conversation about how the world was changing. And it was the first time that somebody had created visual evidence that was comprehensible and dynamic, uh, where you could show the general public something to say, see, this is real. This is not hypothetical. This is not about computer models or about, uh, you know, some graph uh, from a black box measurement. This is real. You can understand it. And so uh, I'm happy to say I think we played a really big part, according to what many, many people have told me, uh, in shifting the public conversation, uh, both in the United States and Canada and Mexico, as well as in Europe, about uh, what's going on with climate change. And you know we've shown the pictures at the White House, uh, at the UK uh, um, House of Commons. Uh, I've been to a couple of the uh, the uh, UN meetings at uh, you know COP uh, what was it COP 15 and COP I don't know you lose count of these things after a while. But Copenhagen and Paris, um, and um, and and at the UN itself uh, several times. So you know, we've had a lot of influence and have gone to a lot of corporations and shown this for various Earth Day events or other kinds of educational events. So uh, I think the pictures have had a tremendous ability to penetrate out there in the world. Um, that said, this new film, The Human Elements, that came out two years ago, that, that looks at ice, but it also looks at the changing air supply. It looks at wildfire. It looks at uh, how oil and gas drilling is impacting human health and the fugitive emissions are impacting human health. That, that also is, is having a tremendous impact because people haven't seen a lot of this stuff put into film before. So uh, that's been making the rounds as well. And, and I'm happy to say having its own uh, influence on, on what people are thinking about and talking about. Yeah. And has this shift in the conversation given you optimism for the movement? Um, I'm supposed to be telling you guys lots of happy roses and moonbeam stories right now, because I know that's what you want to hear. <laughs> but I think that that jackass we have in the White House has just been a catastrophe. Uh, and all of his henchmen and battalions have just been horrible. Um, and I have felt quite dark about what those guys are doing. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's nice to see that the cost of 
fossil fuel energy is uh, is on a par with the renewable energy. I think that's a huge, huge, huge development. Um, so there are good things happening, uh, but uh, there are entrenched forces that are trying very, very, very hard to pour oil down from the castle ramparts on our heads. And it makes me furious and it makes me angry. And I'm sure you guys are angry about it too. And I think you have a damn good right to be angry. Uh, these, are, these are frustrating times. And uh, the, the idiot in the White House has taken us backwards. And that's, I, I find, unbelievably unfortunate to put it mildly. So I, uh, to, the short answer is, look, uh, the, the, the nature always wins. Nature laps last on this stuff. And the, the reality of the physics and the chemistry and the biology are what they are. You know, you can't lobby that stuff away and it's going to keep uh, being a force and keep being a presence that's going to keep slapping people in the face and saying, wake up, look what's happening. And that more than, Anything else is what's going to keep moving this conversation along. Um, I was, I was, but on another front here, and I, I'm really going off the rails a little bit, but I think it's important to say this. Uh, I'm writing a, a new book right now, and, and something, a paragraph I was grappling with this morning that was that came at the end of a, of a chapter about uh, uh, carbon-based fuels, is to say that. You know, in the United States, we have always had this ideology about how we are independent and free. Nobody's allowed to step on our independence and our freedom, and every single atomized individual is supposed to be able to do any damn thing they want, and not have to give a damn about anything about society or community. That's not what they said in the American Revolution. That's not really what they were after. They wanted to be free from the King of England, but they also recognized that there was a society on this side of the ocean that needed to work together to achieve common ends. And um, this distortion of that ideology that's happened in recent years uh, has taken what was one of the best things about American thinking and turned it into one of the most poisonous things. And if we don't learn how to act as a society instead of uh, atomized individuals, uh, we keep listening to this extreme right-wing rhetoric, it'll turn out that the best of what America has to offer the world turns out to be its downfall in its distortion. We've got to fix that. And we've seen it that issue play out in COVID very, very clearly. And we've also seen it play out in the climate story. In both cases, there's a faction that says, don't bother me. I don't want to hear about it. That's for those other guys. I'm my own guy. I'm going to drive whatever gigantic truck I want to drive. I'm going to carry whatever automatic weapon I want to carry in the streets. Don't tread on me. That's not going to work. The society is too big and too complicated. So uh, that's not what you asked about, but I thought it was important to mention it. That is certainly important to um, mention. And honestly, I look forward to reading your new book. Wow. Um, and so kind of building on that last question with your ability to combine science and art and the way that that reaches people in other ways that um, the other methods of awareness simply cannot. Uh, I was wondering if your work has inspired any policy changes or other conservation efforts and what might some of your success stories be? Yeah, um, well, I've had people who worked for oil companies that have, in the one guy, uh, Richard, um, what's his name? Richard Ward, I think. Uh, is in the film saying, you know, I, I worked for uh, an oil company and uh, when I saw this work, I, I had to bail and I had to turn in a different direction. There, that He's not the only one who said that. Uh, and many, many, many people have come up to me and, and said that it changed their view of things, including uh, a guy who laid all kinds of uh, oil and gas pipeline out in the American West in Utah and Nevada. Um, policy is more fugitive and, and fickle and hard to put your finger on. I mean, what have we had in the way of effective federal policy about climate? Nothing. And what we had under the Obama administration had to be done under executive orders. And the, the idiot has uh, reversed almost everything that was that had been done for the past 30 years. So I can't take any great credit for having affected uh, specific uh, policy changes. Uh, I wish I could. Uh, but I think in Europe, certainly, we've had some 
impact and some effect on being part of pushing those governments forward into the things that they've done in places like Germany and Switzerland and France and Scandinavia. The evidence we've supplied, we've supplied activists exactly like you with visual evidence that I, I know has been carried around into these policy centers. But you know, the truth of the matter is, and you, you have to keep this in mind for, your, for yourself with your group, your group, um, no one thing fixes any of this stuff. You know, there's nobody that's got the silver bullet, nobody who can just pull a lever and say, oh, we're gonna do this, we're going to fix this, and here's how. You know, it's just lots and lots and lots of people and pieces and, and opportunities pushing along bit by bit by bit. And together things come, come united and they, they can move the conversation and the policy forward. Um, and so in the film, you discuss cryokinite and the harmful effect it has on snow melt rate. And in June of 2014, National Geographic published an article explaining how snow is becoming dirty and dark due to air pollution. And as a result, that snow is absorbing more light and therefore more heat from the sun and that melting is accelerated. So could you refresh your memories a little bit on what cryokinite is and elaborate on the importance of uh, combating air pollution? Yeah. Um, we ought to go all the way upwind on that, uh, and I hope I come back to answering the question once I, once I get done going a long way upwind. But the, um, um, when you burn uh, coal in a power plant, or you burn uh, a diesel exhaust, or you have a wildfire, there are all sorts of little particles that go in the air. You see some of it, a lot of it you don't see. And um, the lighter material lofts up uh, pretty high and it circulates around the earth and it can go a long, long, long way. Um, and in, in the, let's say the, the, the European Alps, you know, France, Switzerland, Austria, um, Italy, you have uh, all the way back at the beginning of the industrial revolution, they can now see in the layers of the ice, the markers from the soot that was coming up from the, the coal-fired industrialization, they can see in the layers that that soot fell out on the ice and it's embedded in the layers of those alpine glaciers right now. We also see the same thing happening in Greenland. Uh, we, uh, I personally was involved with the study that, that was done <clears throat> at uh, the University of Nevada in Reno uh, where their ice researcher there was working with a British archaeologist. And there had been an ice core that got drilled uh, in the Greenland ice sheet for the uh, years, the years I think were 3000 BC to about um, 1500 AD. And when I was there in the lab, I was watching them melt the ice and checking out the, the very detailed chemist chemical signatures of all these different layers that were that were trapped in the ice over those hundreds and thousands of years and they could see in greenland the smelters in spain and germany that were being used by the roman empire to melt coins to melt metals for coins and swords they could see when those smelters were active because the gook in the air was rising up, getting blown to the northwest and landing on the Greenland ice sheet. And the signature of that stuff was trapped in the ice sheet. Even more crazy is they could, I, I watched this in amazement as the sampling computers were watching the chemical signatures coming off the machines. You would have a standard amount of chemical signature for X number of years, and then all of a sudden it would drop off. And a few years later, it would come back and you get a standard signature again and maybe 10 or 20 years later, it would drop off. And I said to the archeologist from Oxford, what is that? And he said, those are plagues. Those are, those are like pandemics. Are those, that's the bubonic plague. There was something in 600 AD, uh, I think it's 600 AD called the Justinian plague. And what would happen is that when these big disease cycles would hit, they either did not have the people to work in the mines and the smelters, or they didn't have the need for the coins and the swords. 
So in any event, the burning in the smelters had diminished. And so we can see it in the Greenland ice sheet, for God's sake. 2,000 years later, it's like, whoa, it's crazy. So uh, back to being a little bit more here and now. The smoke that we get in our wildfires in the, in the western part of the U.S., that winds up in Greenland. We can see that depositing in the Greenland ice sheet. Um, I was at the North Pole uh, last summer on a Russian icebreaker. That poster right behind me, where is it? Right there, was the icebreaker that I went on up to the pole. And as we were coming back from the pole, we were about a day out of the northern edge of Russia. You still couldn't see the land out there but there was this tremendous pall of smoke that was blowing from the south to the north. That was from 11 fires that were down in Sweden that were totally out of control. And we were a thousand miles away from that, but this, this gunk in the air was blowing way, way up north and was going to wind up on the ice. So all of this stuff eventually accumulates and it, and it swirls around on the Greenland ice sheet. What happens is that the particulates from burning of whatever uh, or source uh, material mixes with a this weird bacteria that somehow manages to live in the ice. It's called cyanobacteria. It's the stuff actually lives in the bottoms of the oceans and it may live on the moon. Nobody really knows, but this stuff is unbelievably durable and it can freeze in the winter time and then come back alive in the summertime. So that's part of what you're seeing in those black deposits in the ice. And whatever is black is like a black T-shirt and it sucks in the sun's heat. You know, out on a, on a scorching 92 degree day here in Colorado, out in the bright sun, you don't go out with a black t-shirt on. You'd much rather wear a white one because the white one bounces away the heat, whereas the black one absorbs it. Same thing happens on the surface of the ice. And so they, um, uh, so this, these black deposits, the cryokinite, whether it's, it's, it's the uh, soot where it's the bacteria, it helps to absorb heat. I keep giving you really long answers that are going all over the place, but you're triggering all sorts of things in my head. I can't help it. <laughs> that's all right, that's what the questions are meant to do. Um, wow, that's incredible about that, that piece of history. Incredible in multiple ways. <laughs> um, and so to and, build and on that. Let me, let me add something there, speaking of a long-winded answer. The reality is that these, effluents, these emissions that we're putting in the atmosphere are going to be out there as traces in the future for a really long time. I'm not talking, that's, I, yeah, I just talked about looking back to what the Romans did, but what we're doing here, the 21st century people, that will show up for somebody else to check out hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of years from now. We don't know what's coming, but our, the traces of our existence are still going to be there and not just in the atmospheric deposits, but also in the sediment that's left behind in landfills. The changes in, in the, uh, the ocean environment, the way the, the, the rock layers and soil layers and sediment layers will look different because of the changes in the species of diatoms and plankton in the ocean. That's all the touch of the human race, the Anthropocene happening in our time and leaving its traces. This is not an abstraction. It's happening right now. and We are absolutely touching the long permanent record of the earth through our activities. Yeah. Um, so kind of building on that same concept, uh, dirty and dark colored snow is being documented in places as close as the San Juan Mountains here in Colorado, not just in far off glaciers. And so if this cryokinite and dirty snow on, on the glaciers, if that could contribute to sea level rise, what are some of the potential effects of fast melting snow on inland mountains? Yeah, there was, I can't remember which summer it was, but uh, I was in the San Juans and uh, God, this, the snow was tan. It was amazing how much gunk was on there from uh, the sand and, well, the silt getting blown out of the Utah and Nevada deserts in Arizona, I guess, too, and landing on the snow fields in, in the southwestern part of the state. What that does is, um, again, it absorbs heat, and that in turn causes the winter snow melt to, to uh, happen faster, and, uh, and, and the, um, the water reservoir represented by the snow fields runs off quicker. 
So, you know, to think about this, if, if for people in other parts of the country, you don't quite realize it, realize it, but mountain snow fields are basically a water tank. You know, they're a water tower. The snow comes down in the wintertime, holding water in the form of those snow crystals, it piles up and those snow fields are literally a water reservoir. So if that reservoir is triggered into running away faster because of dark materials on the snow, then that farmer downstream or that town downstream that needs water to, to, uh, for its people to drink, it, it disappears a lot quicker through that uh, accelerated melting. And that's, that's what happens during these cycles. I, uh, we've had a very, very light snow year, by the way, down in that part of the state this year. I was just down there last week and people are, I mean, it's unbelievably hot and dry. There hasn't been any rain for weeks and weeks and weeks. And uh, the, uh, there was a very early snow melt, not because of uh, any, any desert dust, but just simply because summer came on really early and the snow fields just went away a month and a half sooner than they were supposed to. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. And uh, so in the film, your, your team witnessed the largest calving event to ever be filmed. And prior to that, you yourself saw a large scale calving. Um, can you give us a reminder definition of what calving is and describe that experience a little bit more? Maybe what some of the sounds were like, the scale of the event and any things or emotions that you were feeling. Um, and then, and what did your assistants have to say when they reported back to you after witnessing that largest event at the, I hope I said this right, Jakobsvon Glacier? Uh, not bad for a, for a girl from Colorado. <laughs> no, Jakobshaven. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And even that's not good uh, Danish, but uh, anyway, it's closer. Um, just to be clear, when these, these glacial fingers come down off uh, off the land, they're, they're, they're rivers of ice, right? And so they, they come off the bedrock and they go out and, and are on top of the water. And down underneath those tongues of ice, there are these very deep fjords of water that go down in some cases thousands of feet deep. So this tongue of ice is sitting uh, uh, on top of the water. And you see about 300 feet of it, maybe 400 feet. And typically there's another thousand to 2000 feet down below the water line. So basically, you know, it's a gigantic iceberg that, that's sitting there. When the calving event happens, to, to be clear, it's spelled C-A-L-V-I-N-G, like a calf of a baby cow. When a calving event happens, the thing fractures all the way from the surface that you can see down through that underwater ice chunk and the whole thing rolls over and falls into the ocean and smashes up as it goes. Um, the first one of those I ever saw was at Columbia Glacier in Alaska. And um, we were actually there to film um, as we were deploying the very first time-lapse cameras. And we had had a really cold day. Uh, we, had, we had put a camera out and we got, it was about 33 degrees and it was pouring rain all day. And we were thrashing around learning how to uh, deploy the cameras. And we were cold and tired and soaking wet, climbed back up the mountain. We're also tired. We didn't even have dinner. We just uh, were so wet and cold, everybody crawled into their tents and tried to get dry and get warmed up again. So I'm laying there in my tent, and there's this huge uh, sound as if fighter jets. You know that sound when the, when the Air Force jets come zooming low over you from some air show or whatever. It sounded like there were like three of them. And you could hear them rumbling across the valley. And I'm thinking, God, the, the clouds are really low. Those, those, you know, those jet jockeys are crazy to be flying out here. And I suddenly realized, oh my God, that's probably the ice breaking up. I'd never heard this before, never seen it before. So I quickly unzipped my tent and I started screaming to the other guys. I said, I think we've got a calving event going on. And I looked out and sure enough, this, the top of the glacier had separated. And there's so much ice involved. It's not moving fast. You know, it's almost like you're seeing something going in slow motion because there's so much mass that has to move. And there's so much underwater resistance pushing back against what's up on the surface that it doesn't go like this, at least not at first. It takes a while. Well, this entire cabin face, almost two miles wide, the entire thing had cracked. There was a crevasse all the way across it. 
about 300 feet in from the front. And this entire crescent shaped piece, two miles wide was in the process of rolling over. And I'm like, holy shit, we have to get film of this. And so I grabbed the video camera I had and guess what? The inside of the lens was fogged because it had been out in the cold rain all day. And, and I looked at it and was like, I, I can't get a picture. Turned out that the other cameraman with me was also fogged. So all I could do was shoot with the still cameras and because it was so rainy, it didn't come out really well. But it was just breathtaking to hear the sound of this thing, like, a, like literally again, like a fighter jet. And to realize you were witnessing this big, epochal, you know, epic event. Um, and then, of course, it turns into this great crashing and cracking sound as everything starts to really go over and break up and topple into the sea. Uh, and then the whole bay has all of these, you know, thousands and thousands of chunks of ice, and they're all smashing into each other. And that goes on for an hour, maybe two hours, as this whole system is trying to regain its, its calm and its equilibrium. All these pieces of ice are smashing into each other. And um, it's exciting. And I, I probably have never seen one as good as that since then. And we don't have any audio and we don't have any pictures. But it's the way it goes sometimes. So um, yeah. it's, uh, when you see these things, it's just exciting to see the drama, obviously, as you can tell from my voice and my reaction. Then at the same time, you stop and you pull back and you go, oh man, that wasn't so good. You know, we, this, in terms of the future of civilization and the future of, uh, of, of nature, you don't want to see these thing, things happening, but they are. So then you say, well, okay, I guess it's good enough that I, I got to be there to see it, but it leaves a, leaves a hole in your heart to realize what actually is going on. Um, my uh, my crew that filmed that uh, that calving event at the Jakobshavn Glacier, the one that's in the film, um, they uh, it just doesn't come across in the film. But they <laughs> they weren't too crazy about going up there on that trip, um, and and we cooked up that idea the previous winter. We that when we were out there with a the dog sledge, you know, you see that scene where we go out with the dog sledge to check on this camera. Well, as we were leaving from that trip and I'm in the airplane, I was looking down through the window and Jeff Orlowski was next to me and I'm thinking about it. And I said, you know what, Jeff? Somebody has to go up there and sit there for a month and just wait and watch and see if, if something happens. And I think it's going to, and I think that the time will be sometime between May 15th and June 15th, but somebody just has to park themselves there and do it. And I looked at him and I said, well, what do you think? He said, oh, yeah, well, <laughs> okay, we can talk about that. Um, but as it emerged, um, the, uh, I, <clears throat> I wound up having to be in Greenland in late June to shoot this, uh, this show for PBS Nova for a documentary for those guys. And I said, I, you know, I can't be away for two and a half months. I have a wife and I have a, a little daughter at home. I can't be away that long. So uh, Jeff, you know, this is a couple months later, Jeff, you and Adam, uh, hmm, how would you like to volunteer for this duty? <laughs> and they grumbled and groaned a little bit, but you know, they, they mustered up and, and they, these, you know, went and they were pretty happy about it um, in the end because they got to see what they saw. But uh, I will never, ever forget um, the day when that happened because I was, uh, I was in the office getting ready for Greenland. I was going to be leaving just a few days later. And Adam called me and he said, you know, we're going nuts. We're sitting here just staring at this thing and nothing's going on. We're freezing. We got beaten up by the wind. It's been cold and miserable. And, you know, I know we told you we would stay out here for a month, but you know, if nothing happens in a few more days, can we just come home? I mean, it, it, you're only getting a tiny little piece of that in the film. They didn't record everything, but that's what he said. So literally, as he's saying this, like, can we come home? He said, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jeff's screaming at me. So uh, he said, uh, uh, hang on, I'll, I'll come back to you and I'll call you back in a couple minutes. So click, the phone goes dead. And he comes back in a couple of minutes and he's all excited. He can't even talk. He said, Jim, this is like the biggest calving event we've ever imagined, ever seen. Please. Oh my God. Oh my God. I can't talk to you. Click. I'll call you back. 
And <laughs> so I don't hear from them for an hour, hour and a half. And then he comes back and he said, I just, you aren't going to believe what we have. And that's, that's the footage that you see in the film. You only see a part of it. If you watch the whole thing for an hour, it just kind of makes your brain explode. You know, it's just incredible to watch the whole thing underway. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing all of these stories and all this information with us. I'm going to pass it over to Kate and Bridget and they'll uh, give you the audience questions. James, thank you so much for coming on. This was so fantastic. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump in with a question really fast. It's actually a personal question. Um, so you said in the movie, Chasing Ice, uh, I liked the science, but I never wanted to be a scientist. And nothing has ever hit more home for me, quite honestly, because I got my degree in geology, worked in a geomorphology lab, and then you know, now I'm working as an environmental advocate because I, feel, I felt very much the same way. I love the science, but I never wanted to be a scientist. Yeah. And so I was just kind of curious, um, you know, you said that you just kind of started taking photography to, you know, film these. I'm curious, what would your suggestions be for new, younger science, non-scientist lovers <laughs> um, to kind of use their skills to kind of help with science communication? Because I think that all of your film and your photography has done such a great job of actually illustrating the issue of climate change. Well, you know, those, those knowledge bases that you get in school or through life experience, or for, from being around friends or parents or whatever it is, uh, that all adds up. The amazing thing is how much of this stuff adds up. My father always used to say to me, um, Jim, learn everything you can because you never know how it's all going to come together. And it was really, really true. Um, so the fact that you have a geology background makes absolutely perfect sense to me that you're now in, in, uh, in environmental activism. You know, it supports your awareness of how the world works and of what matters and how, you know, um, how things tie together. So I think that that, that a broad area of knowledge is really important. I, I think it's more important for people who want to be communicators uh, than, than a specific communication backgrounds necessarily is. I mean, the, the two things work just fine. It's not bad to have a communication degree. That's, exact, that's actually what I had as an undergraduate. And then I did geology in grad school, a geomorphology, in fact, just the way you were interested. Um, so you... Uh, you build your enthusiasms based on what your passions are. You know, if you tend to be somebody who goes, yeah, rocks, are you kidding? I don't care about rocks. I care about the deer and the wolves and whatever. Well then, you know, you build your enthusiasm on that or I care about the, the, uh, the plants. You know, they, there's, there's lots of room to exercise one's passions in, in these things. And you, and you go from those inherent passions um, out to applying them in different ways. Um, the, the, this business of making pictures and telling stories is much, much, much harder than it looks. It looks easy when it's all done. It's hard when you're doing it. And those, the tools of the trade are hard to use and they can often be very expensive to use. Um, I've just been appointed uh, a professor at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. And the thing that they want me to come and give seminars about is about this issue of, 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 of uh, art and science integration and climate communication and so on. And I know, I know what I've, because I've already been asked this at some of the round tables that I've been there for. I know that some, somebody who's uh, uh, let's say a computer modeler for atmospheric science is going to say to me, well, okay, I'm ready to make a movie about this. Tell me what I should do. And my answer is, dude, you don't have the reflexes for it. You need to partner with somebody who's got the visual reflexes. You can't go from staring at pixels your whole life to knowing how to see light and form and color. You know, it's a, it's a different nerve ending and it's very difficult to uh, integrate these things. Um, you know, I was, I was enough of a scientist when I was in graduate school to, to assimilate some things, but I didn't assimilate a lot of what I could have. And a lot of what I did assimilate, I purposely pushed out of my head 
when I decided I wanted to get into photography because I didn't want to spend my whole life being in this reductionist, like carve everything into little tiny science pieces every time I you know, drove past a road outcrop or whatever. I wanted to see things whole. And so I had this, I had this weird schizophrenic uh, bipolar thing in my head. I was aesthetic by, that was my fundamental wiring but I also had this knowledge up there on top and I was lucky in being able to bring those together. But uh, the aesthetic as a mountaineer, as somebody who liked to camp, somebody who liked to canoe, somebody who liked to rock climb and ice climb, all of those things were at the core of my instincts, not the science per se. So I built from the core of my instincts and then laid the science on top of it. And the fact of the matter is I did not do any um, ice science for, I don't know, decades after I left grad school. That's a lot of what I studied in grad school, but I didn't do any of it for years. And when I came back and started the Extreme Ice Survey project or the couple years before that, I felt like, ah, I'm back in home territory. I kind of like this, I know this stuff. And uh, it's, it's been gratifying to be back in that world again, but I'm not a hardcore scientist by any stretch of the imagination. Sorry, again, I keep giving you long answers. I don't know what's wrong with me today. Well, I'm fascinated. And I think for so many of the answers you've given, keep bringing me back to this place of interconnectedness. You've talked about how the, these issues are interconnected, how we as people are interconnected. And then in this answer just now, how none of us are doing it alone. You know, none of this is happening as, as one person or one policy change. And I think that is something I keep hearing and has been really illuminating. Um, so we have to get through <laughs> Eight questions in 10 minutes, James. <laughs> okay, quick ones now. I, I promise to zip it. Okay, go ahead. All right. So we have, and this is great. Everyone who's on here, thank you so much for being so participatory. These are really excellent questions. We're going to start with a softball. When can we buy your book? When, it's, when is it going to be on shelves? Okay, new book will be out in uh, September, October of next year, 2021. It will be a gigantic book you know, physically large, in a slip case, 450 pages. It will be, um, it's a retrospective of 40 years of looking at the Anthropocene. The title of it is Time Capsule, Photographs from the Anthropocene, 1980 to 2020. And um, there will be uh, quite a few words in there by a museum curator and by what I'm writing, but uh, mostly it'll be photographs spanning a whole lot of material, including ice, but there's fires and there's forests and there's endangered wildlife and there's mining and all kinds of stuff in there. Um, this may also be a softball question, but uh, is there a way to watch the full footage of that calving event, um, the, the massive 75 minute one? <laughs> good, good point. Um, as I was saying it, I was thinking, you know, somebody's going to ask you, Jim, you better watch it. Um, no, <laughs> there, there isn't, um, unfortunately. Um, do you, anybody remember the Andy Warhol movies where he just kind of locked off the camera and he looked at the Empire State Building just standing there? It's sort of like that because the calving moves so slowly that in any one minute, you don't see much happening again because of the mass of this thing. But then over time, you see this unfold. I found it incredibly mesmerizing to watch it, which I did a number of times after we got the footage back. But no, unfortunately, we don't have it online. We'll just have to go post up for a couple months ourselves and wait. There you go. Um, the next question is, does burning wood, um, as in using wood as a biofuel, contribute to particles in the atmosphere? Yeah, I wish I knew more about that than I do. Yes, it does contribute to particles in the atmosphere, no question about it. Do they, do they get entrained up high in the atmosphere and stay up there for a while? Honestly, I don't know. I should know the answer to that, and I don't. Uh, I do know that in uh, uh, relatively narrow mountain valleys like what you, we have in the Alps or let's say Vail, Colorado, um, where it's you know deep V-shaped valleys and, and you have you're going to have inversions of uh, air layers in the winter time. That uh, back in the day when people burned a lot of um, uh, wood in fireplaces, it was bad. The air pollution would get very bad in these apparently pristine mountain valleys because it would get trapped in there. Not good. 
Um, so that's why so many of these places, both in Europe and the United States, have basically outlawed wood burning in the in, at all, but particularly in the winter time in these valleys. Um, okay, so I'm going to combine two questions because I think they're kind of similar. Uh, one is, what's the future of the environment? And then also, in your opinion, James, will modern civilization be able to live as it has for the next 100 years, or will changes happen quicker or too quickly? I, I think clearly we have to make some adjustments. I think that realization is coming through. And, and uh, on a different front, you know, the, the COVID pandemic has, has demonstrated the importance of, of not continu continuing with business as usual. Uh, certainly climate issues and general environmental issues are tied to what could be positive change, tied to reaction to COVID. Whether or not that actually happens, God only knows. We have such a screwed up political system that's so full of graft and corruption. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, the future of the environment is that the environment's going to be here, you know, and I, I'm more optimistic about the human race than a lot of people are. I get a question almost all the, all the time or, or in lecture rooms where somebody always says, well, how many years do you think before humanity destroys itself. I don't think that's going to happen. I, I think, you know, as stupid as we are sometimes, we, uh, uh, there still is a basic desire on the part of Homo sapiens to exist as an organism. And I think we will keep that going. Uh, and if we do something that's absolutely catastrophic and wipe ourselves out, the environment will adjust. It's amazing how fast things self-correct and go back to some other form that, uh, that the Earth system wants to have. And I want to go back uh, uh, and pick up on, on one of the other uh, uh, answers uh, about, you know, what's in, what's in the future. I, I want to uh, suggest that if you can, watch the human element. That ties together a lot of these issues. The human element is available on, geez, at least half a dozen streaming services, including iTunes, Google Play, uh, Xbox, it was on Amazon Prime or Amazon for a while. I can't remember which one. Um, <clears throat> and that takes a broader view of these environmental issues than Chasing Ice does. Chasing Ice is a vertical story, drilling down uh, you know, through the ice by way of talking about climate change. We do that in the human element, but we also tie together a lot of other changing variables. And I think uh, this audience would particularly enjoy that. I can't wait to watch it. Um, I, Chasing Ice, I, had to, I was not going to waste our time on how much I loved that documentary. Um, our next question is, early, and, and you touched on this, but I do want to ask it. Early screenings were able to change people's minds on climate change. Um, are you still encountering climate skeptics self-reporting that they now acknowledge human-caused climate change? So you talked about this earlier. I think you've answered it, but is there anything else? you want to say on that, on your experience with people shifting? Yeah, you know, the, the truth of the matter is that there will always be a faction of people who are either are not going to believe the evidence about climate change. I, I want to take that word believe out of the mix, actually. I just said it. It's a bad word. I, and I correct people who ask me about that on airplanes or whatever all the time. It's not a question of whether or not you believe in climate change. My answer is always, I think climate change happens because of the evidence. And that's the conversation we need to have with people. The, the people who are the deniers are steadfast in their belief. They are not willing to put the evidence and the information and the thought into understanding it. They're locked into their ideological belief systems. So those kinds of people are absolutely impervious. They're as impervious as Mount, Mount Rushmore is to change. You know, you just can't do it. And it's not worth the effort. Early in the Extreme Ice Survey, uh, I had a lot of debates with my, the young guys on my team. They're saying, hey, we've got to go down to the, the Exxon Mobil uh, 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 shareholders meeting and we have to show them what's going on and how they have to change. I said, Why are you wasting your time? Our audience is the center of the spectrum, and it's the group of people like our audience here today who understand what's going on. We want to inspire and animate you guys, and we want to go into the middle of the spectrum where it's not ideologues and fanatics, 
and try and peel some people over onto our side of the spectrum. You're never going to go to, to those guys who are screaming at Gretchen Whitmer in the in the Michigan Capitol building over, over COVID and trying to get them to go for gun control, let's say, uh, and, and climate, climate change uh, activism. Just forget it. Just don't waste your energy on those guys. Um, okay, so is there a point when the melting of glaciers slash a rise in sea level will affect the Gulf Stream? That's a really good question. There have been a lot of uh, debates about that in the science community. Uh, there is a possibility that that'll happen. That's, that's not a sort of a first order of, of event that's going to alter things. That, that's going to be after there's a lot of breakdown of the Greenland ice sheet before that happens. Uh, so I don't think that's an imminent thing to worry about. The imminent issue with large changes of polar ice is down in Antarctica. And we don't talk about that in the film because we, we weren't shooting Antarctica when we did Chasing Ice. But uh, the, the huge glaciers in West Antarctica are very unstable. They've been retreating quickly. They're behaving in a very similar fashion to what we've seen in the past 20 years in Greenland as, a, as an easier to work with model. Greenland is easier to work on than Antarctica is. But the satellites are telling us that West Antarctica is behaving through the same kinds of dynamics. If West Antarctica continues to speed up, continues to break down, we're going to see very big sea level coming out of that in your lifetimes. You know, we're, we're talking multiple feet of sea level in your lifetimes. Whew, yeah. <laughs> um, so you actually were able to knock out two questions in one on that one. Great job. The other question was, um, is the, Oh, I lost it. Oh, is the phenomenon of ice melting in Greenland different in some interesting ways from Antarctica? And I think you just, you answered that. Um, so our the, dynamics are not, the dynamics are not identical because of the different climate situations, but there are a lot of analogies, yes. Great, not great, but you know, yes. <laughs> um, so the last question is, as a non-photographer, I find taking pictures may mean I don't actually look in the moment at the subject. Are you in the moment when you photograph, unlike me? That's a really fascinating question. And I've actually uh, wrestled with that a lot my whole life. There are times inside that black box where you see things so purely and so intensely and so clearly, you never see it, you see the world with that degree of richness and precision ever. Because, you know, your eye is just running around here and you're looking at the periphery and up and down and sideways and your eyes skittering around and you're distracted when your eye is away from the camera. But when things are in that magical zone inside that box, you distill the whole world down into it. And I literally get an electrical feeling in my, the forearm on my, my, of my left arm. I learned that a long time ago. It'll start like almost like there's champagne bubbles in there. And I, and I get this electric charge from it. Um, that's when it's going really well. And there's other times, just like the person who asked the question, when messing around with the camera takes you out of the moment and you're not really there. You're screwing around with the equipment. You're going, oh God, I have to find a beautiful picture. I'm so stupid today. I'm not finding a good picture. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, <laughs> I'm wasting my life here. Um, and that's when photography is toxic. <laughs> you know, I don't know any other way to put it. Um, so it goes back and forth. But the, uh, the joy of photography is when that magic happens and that lightning bolt happens and you get this incredible connection with something. Um, I did a huge body of work for 10 years on endangered wildlife, portraits of endangered species. And all of that came out of one 20 minute period looking at a rhinoceros at the San Diego Wild Animal Park. And he was four feet away from me as I sat in the back of this pickup truck. And we just sat there and stared at each other. And it was this unbelievable, mystical um, connection between that animal and I. And it was just from that intense scene. But I never took a picture. I just sat there and I watched him. And so 
camera, ha camera took me to the place, but I was afraid to bring the camera up and startle him. So I didn't even bring it. I just wanted to stay in that, that zone that we were in. And uh, it was the right thing. I didn't need to have the picture, but I had that experience and that triggered all these ideas that led to 10 years worth of beautiful work. That is amazing. Um, well, I think, Bridget, are there any more questions on Facebook Live? We've gotten through the ones on Zoom. No, they're all, they're all done on Facebook Live. James, we cannot thank you enough for being here. Every part of this has truly blown my mind. And thank you for your, your work. Like you said, without the data and the evidence that you provide, we wouldn't be able to, you know, to do our work in influencing policy and in changing hearts and minds. So thank you so much for, for everything that you have done and, and continue to do. And I'm can't wait to see your book. Well, you're most welcome. I, I'm glad for the audience. I'm glad for all the enthusiasm. And I wish you the very best of luck with all the great work that you're doing. It's God's work. It's essential it gets done. It'll, it'll seem like forever to make any progress, you know. But as Gandhi said, just because it seems impossible doesn't mean you shouldn't be doing it. You know, you just keep on doing it. So good luck with that. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being so, here. Thank you, James. So for, for our guests who are on, um, Jess has, has a cool event coming up she wants to talk about, and then I have some announcements. So stick with us if you don't mind for one more minute. Jess, take it away. Yeah, so if y'all like joining us on these calls and learning, um, <laughs> tap it away from it. Uh, so next week on Wednesday, July 29th at 5 p.m., we're hosting another virtual event. And this time it's about composting and zero waste programs in Boulder, Colorado. And our guest speakers for that are going to be Tim Broderick, a zero waste specialist with the Boulder County, and Dan Mash, Matt um, from EcoCycle in Boulder, who will teach us how to start our own composting at home. So if you're interested in that, again, that's 5 p.m. Mountain Time. Um, Kate should be posting a link in the chat and um, you can register from there. So thank you for participating here. Hope to see you next week. Thank you, Jess. And again, thank you everybody for coming on Conservation Conversations. Um, if you like all of the work that we've been doing, please consider donating to Environment Maryland, Environment Missouri, Environment Colorado, and buy James's book, please when it comes out next year. <laughs> um, one thing that, one note that we have for Conservation Conversations, we will not have Conservation Conversations next week. We are kind of changing up the format to give you an even better, bigger Conservation conversation. So hold tight and just follow all of our social media and we'll keep you updated. Kate, do you have anything else? I just wanted to say again, thank you all. You all were really a phenomenal audience. The questions we got were, the questions you all asked in addition where I was like, gosh, that's such a good question. I, I'm so excited to ask this, which is why I really wanted to get through them all. So thank you all for being here. We hope you'll join us next time. Um, as Bridget said, next week, we're, we're taking a week off, but that means you have the week open to attend the Great Compost webinar. If you have any <laughs> questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us, contact us on social media. And again, thank you for your concern on this issue. Um, and you know what, Bridget, we didn't ask the what can we do, but I think he sort of answered it, you know, um, through his everything he said. So, um, yeah, thank you all so much. Thanks, y'all. Have a good night. Thank you.